Welcome, Elsie. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the, there's been a couple of new people we've seen um, clock on for this who haven't been part of the rest of the retreat. So thank you for, for coming to this. Um, we've done previous retreats and Elsie's been part of them and they've just been stunning, stunning contributions. And we were just saying just before this, um, before we started recording, just how much we all benefit from your, your wisdom, Elsie, and oh. your, your experience. You know, your experience is invaluable. And yeah, whilst we can, we, we want to make the most of that. And Jenny and I, ourselves, we, we benefit greatly from it. So oh. selfish as well. <laughs> but we just want to hand this over to you now, Elsie. I was just going to say that Elsie finished, uh, was the last speaker of our last oh, retreat. Yeah. And it was just the perfect way to end and it felt like she'd been part of the retreat the whole time like everything that she spoke to it just fits so beautifully and I know there's been things that came to mind after that talk that really showed me the simplicity again and how easy it is to kind of move away from that so I'm really excited to to sit back and mm. hand it over to you so thank you so much for being here yeah and perhaps you could tell us about your book at some point during this the new <laughs> book oh gosh what an opportunity that's just wonderful thank you both dave and jenny honestly you you are dear to my heart and i've loved um being able to work with you and i mentioned at the last retreat that i feel not only what you offer in such a humble loving down-to-earth way but that you offer these retreats by donation and um, given the current situation in the world, I, I think that's just a very generous, loving thing that you, you do. And I thank you for that. I think it's beautiful. That's part of the reason that I was drawn to working with you is because of that, that humbleness, that loving generosity that you both share with others. So um, yeah. This is um, what makes my heart sing. I, um, I wasn't sure what I was going to be doing this year. I actually thought I might take a year sabbatical and do nothing, you know, just relax and have time with Ken and the family. And, uh, and that felt really good. You know, I've been doing and sharing this work for 46 years. So I thought, you know, maybe this is my time. To, to just not do any more calls or podcasts or webinars or mentoring. And, and then mine spoke, you know, the book that I've just released, mine mentored me as mine mentors all of us. And um, out of the blue, I had requests for mentoring, one-on-one -on -one mentoring. And, and they moved me, the email requests moved me. And I'm always guided by the feeling of mind, the feeling that comes through so strong. And, and so I listened and I accepted. And before you knew it, um, I was booked for 2021. And I thought like, how did this happen? Because it ended up that I felt I was actually booked too much, that I'd taken too much on again, sort of my old pattern of service. And um, because I love it so much, you know, I love talking with people, I learn so much from those that I have the privilege of, of talking with. And I also noticed that when I had pulled back a little from doing quite so much, uh, and part of that was uh, the travel because of the pandemic, but that had also come to me prior to the pandemic was to, to just cherish my body and my soul, be in service to myself as well as to others. Because it's so seductive, this service to humanity. And that was one of Sid's first, um, how can I say this, messages that he himself heard during this epiphany was that he knew these three spiritual gifts that he'd uncovered were gifts that would help alleviate 
humanity suffering. That was one of the things that he said to us when he came to visit us three days after his epiphany. And, and, and he himself was so guided by service and having sort of grown up with him in a sense in, in my journey of learning and unfolding from the inside out, I followed that. And I was also so grateful to be able to, to share this with having no background in public speaking or in psychology, I was a homemaker with also just grade 12 education, which isn't a big deal nowadays. I mean, you know, if you don't have university, it seems that can get in the way. And I'm going to say right here and right now that that doesn't necessarily have to stand in your way of what you want to offer. If you want to offer something that you've learned through this understanding and through your own insights that you've had. Um, I think I've said this in the past, but your first insight is like your, your graduation certificate and you're ready to go. It's that spiritual graduation that we've all been gifted with. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I wasn't sure how my journey was going to unfold. And, and then my writing started to blossom as I had more time to just be, you know, just live and, and love. And, and I couldn't believe how the writing came out. Like I've published two books basically in, in a year. I published Nuggets of Wisdom 2 in last September and then Mentored by Mind just a week or two ago. And it's been with ease and a tremendous joy working with my daughter and my daughter-in-law who have, have just assisted me, inspired me. And Ken, who was just so staunch, sort of a little bit in the background, but like a rock, you know, he just doesn't say much. I'm the chatterbox in the family, but he, he can take something that I've chattered on and on about and wrap it up in one sentence. And Barb Banks used to be like that. You know, Sid was the talker. He became the talker after his um, profound insight. And Barb was the quiet one. And I remember doing a, a retreat with her, the one and only time that she traveled with anybody other than Sid. Uh, I was invited to San Francisco, sort of after the fact. People there in San Francisco had invited Sid to do a retreat for them at Berkeley University. And Sid, at that point, after he and I had traveled around the US, he said, uh, take Elsie instead. And, uh, you know, she'll, she'll do a fine job for you all. And they were going like, oh, gee, <laughs> well, we want you, Sid. You're the man. You know, we would like you to come. And Sid said, no, you know, give her, give her a chance. And so um, they did. And Sid also said, uh, and Barb, you know, he wanted Barb to go with me. And she was a bit reluctant. But she did come with me and uh, we did this retreat together. And again, I was the chatterbox as I began to, to find my legs, you know, to find my grounding, to uh, just share, even though I might blabber on for a while, you know, not knowing what was going to come out, whether it would be uh, insightful or just whatever. But I, it came out, you know, and then it came out purer and purer. That's what happens when you have the courage to just share. And then my self-consciousness would, would evaporate. And all of a sudden, there was just mind coming through me 
to the audience and touching mind minds in the audience and and so then we were on you know we were on this journey together and it was mutual there was that connection of mind in the audience and mind with me and mind with Barb. And, and again, like Barb didn't say much, but when she spoke, it, it just went so deep. After all, you know, she was living with Sid. She'd seen what had happened to her man and, um, and had a little bit of anxiety at first. It's like, who is this? What did you do with Sid? You know, where has he gone? What's happened to this man that I'm so familiar with in all our years of marriage? And now he was completely different. He didn't respond or react, I should say, to her and sometimes her innocent, um, provoking remarks to him. He just didn't dance to the same tune anymore. And she was very puzzled and a bit anxious about this, like what would happen to their relationship? And, and he was just so kind and so gentle and so loving to her that in a very short time, she had her own sight then that started her on her journey. So she had so much depth. Uh, and, and then when I saw that she had changed as well, based on her own insight, that disturbed me. And I thought, oh, you know, what has he done to my friend Barb? What has that man done to my friend Barb? <laughs> like, she was happy. Her face had softened and like Sid's, the, the lines and the stress and the anxiety was gone. And she just, she already was a gentle soul, you know, she was a nurse. And, um, and so there was a gentle caring already about her. But after having that insight and realizing to a degree, the profound honor that had been bestowed upon Sid to have the spontaneous insight, she realized that something very unique and special was going on. And, and as I saw this dramatic change in her, I thought to myself, um, I didn't think to myself, oh, her heart is singing. I just thought, what have you done to my friend? You've brainwashed her, you know? And, and I, in my fear, that's what I thought, that he had brainwashed her. And so now fast forward as I, again, had these wonderful opportunities that were just came out of the blue to me this, this year to talk with new people, um, people I've never heard of, and yet somehow they were drawn to reach out. And inevitably what they'd say is, we want to go deeper. And, and that's what speaks to me, that, um, Desire without desire. And that feels like being mentored by mind. It's not like I'm searching, I got to get this. It's I, I felt from those that approached me, this feeling of I know there's something more. And I would love to talk with you about that something more. And so again, there was this mutual learning together and a lot of younger people, um, more men reached out to me this time. In all of the 46 years I've been doing this, I've worked a lot with women who have been drawn to work with me. But this time, again, out of the blue, I've had 85% men and 15% women, like go figure. And maybe it was me that maybe some men thought, especially businessmen, she's too touchy feely. You know, she's all about the feeling and we don't want that in business necessarily. 
And yet that's really, as I began to talk with some of these business executives and coaches, uh, that's what they were looking for. They were looking for, how do I share this understanding without it being too kind of woo-woo? And, and then it came to me, not that they voiced it, but they would share stories that encapsulated their own wisdom that they didn't see themselves. They were just storing, sharing a story. And, and to me, it was so profound what they shared. Like their wisdom was so visible in their story. And, and so then I'd, I'd say like, do you, do you see what you said? What you just shared with me? Well, yeah, like I said, this and that, you know, but there was no oomph behind the, well, yeah, you know, I said this, blah, 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 blah. but there was oomph for me. And so then that I could see was my job was to point to their wisdom, to help their wisdom become visible to them. And, and then I would, what came to me again, because I never know what I'm going to say. I'm just so in the moment with whoever I'm talking with. What came to me is like, have you shared what you just shared with me with some of your clients or your groups that you're coaching? And nearly always from the men, especially, the answer would be, well, no, you know, cause that's like, you know, no. And, and it finally dawned on me as I explored that know with them is that their background in coaching prior to the principles learning where you didn't reveal yourself typically either as a therapist or a coach or a psychotherapist or whatever oftentimes in the social service field you don't reveal yourself there there's a bit of a distance there isn't that equality in terms of we're all the same. And what you've experienced, I've experienced, perhaps in a different disguise, but literally we're all the same. And, and that was one of Sid's primary teaching points is talk story, he used to say. Talk story, share your story, share your vulnerability. And again, for some of the men I've been coaching, sharing their vulnerability, sharing the before and after picture wasn't sort of natural to their intellect. But the reason they approached me was to go beyond their intellect. And so when I saw that and then highlighted their wisdom, for them, it just naturally released more wisdom for them. And they felt, they felt their true nature more and could share their true nature in their way. And so that's been kind of the journey that we've, we've had is highlighting people's wisdom. There's never been a client that I've worked with, that I've not seen or heard a nugget of wisdom. I had someone come to me uh, a week or so ago who I could see by her face when she came on board that she was a little stressed and anxious. And I said, how are you doing? And she said, um, you know, not, not great. She was worried about a couple of things. And I didn't go into what she was worried about. Um, I was interested in, in how, what she enjoyed in life, not what she worried about in life, but what she enjoyed in life. And that helped her slip out of 
that little bit of anxiety that she was experiencing. And, and it struck me like when she said that, you know, I go in and out of these moments where I'm not feeling great. And I was like, so? <laughs> like, who does it? We all do. That's the journey. Is we have moments when we're not feeling great, when we're gripped by our thinking. And so what? I use that so what, which was an insight for me, a great deal because it's so powerful. It's so freeing. So that was what blossomed in our discussion is like, so what you have those moments of you not feeling great and being gripped? And she said, well, I feel that if I don't address those issues, that I'm not being responsible. And I said, well, what about the things that you like in life? Tell me a little bit about that. And she said, well, I, um, and it took her a bit before she could verbalize what she enjoyed in life because her mind had been focused on what was wrong. And then she came out with the most profound wisdom that she'd woken up that morning with an insight about something about mind. Wow. And, and I asked her to share a little bit more about that. And, and she did. And I thought, that's so beautiful what you just shared. Like, focus on that rather than what's wrong. Focus on what's right. Focus on that nugget that you woke up with. And then she mentioned that she writes. And um, I thought, wow, that's beautiful. Like, to me, anybody that does anything like, like that, you know, writes or sings or loves nature, goes for walks, is a sculptor, you know, painter, whatever, anything like that, to me, is, is a spiritual gift. You're a knitter. You crochet. You golf. You know, anything like that that you enjoy is a spiritual gift to be cherished. And to honor that, like to honor those things that are lovely in your life, rather than honoring what's not lovely. And I could see that she was a bit hesitant about that, but then isn't that denial? Like, am I not then avoiding what's wrong in my life? As we explored what's right in her life even more, and the fact that I could visibly on screen see her voice change or her uh, face changing, it's like, are you feeling clearer about what's right? And she said, well, like I do feel that, but I'm not interested in your butts, <laughs> uh, so to speak. Like, I'm interested in, in your clarity. What feels good? Because when you're feeling good, when you're honoring what's right in your world, you have clarity. And then the issues that are there in your life, you see with clarity, not with judgment. When you're looking at the issues, trying to figure out how to deal with them, judgment doesn't provide clarity. Judgment clouds clarity. And, and so you look at that, the value of that beautiful feeling that comes, because that beautiful feeling isn't just touchy-feely thing. It is prominent in our journey. That deep 
feeling of love, of understanding, of honoring what's right in our world, despite all the stuff we see that is wrong. I know that. I'm not blind. I'm not hiding from it. I see what's going on in our, our, our global environment, in our, our global inequality, injustice. I see that. I know there are many ways to address that. We can go out and we can fight it. We can go out and stand strong with those uh, to, to bring up out justice and equality and, and do it with grace and respect for those on the other side who were lost, not with judgment. Because as soon as we start to judge again, what's wrong in the world, we're caught. We're caught up in the mess. And so it's like, where, where do we want to live? Do we want to live in fighting the mess? Or do we want to live in love and understanding and clarity that, first of all, sends out a ripple of love, of agape, unconditional love that Martin Luther King talked about into the world? And trust that that in and of itself will help settle down the world. Why? Because every living soul on this planet, the environment, everything is that pure spiritual energy. And the more we as human beings live from there, and operate from there, the more it elevates the world. Just look at what has happened to the environment as in a sense, the world has given us all a kick in the behind to demand that we stay at home and not travel. So there's not the same kind of pollution in the air and the waterways and oceans and Venice Canal and all of that has cleaned up. The ozone hole is not as big as it was. Like what looks like absolute tragedy. And I, I respect, I know that we've lost people and friends and family. Honor and respect that but even more honor, respect the good that has come from what has gone wrong in the world. To me, the world has been mentored by mind in terms of giving us this pandemic. The same as when we've had diseases. When my husband was diagnosed with cancer 12 years ago, I felt like my world had fallen apart. And Ken was no doubt taken aback, uh, didn't know what to do. You know, what, where does he go? What does he do? How does he take care of this? And, and what came to him, instead of kind of scrambling around too much, I saw him get really quiet. Uh, I was the scrambler you know, like panicking, what, what to do. He did what the doctor said, ended up having major surgery. And even when he went through that, it was like matter of fact, down to earth, doing what needs to be done to take care of business, his health, without judgment, not questioning, like, did I do something wrong? Like, why me? 
uh, not judgment of anything other than how, how best can I handle this? And out of that clarity, uh, even before he had his surgery, he realized that if I've got X amount of time to live because it was stage four cancer, um, I'm taking early retirement. Now, again, his practical side had him go through the pensions and the economics and all of that, right? It wasn't great, but he was still moved to, I want to live my life the best I can. And he did. He took early retirement. He went fishing. He went fishing before his surgery. He sailed through his surgery, even though he got infected and so on and so forth. And it was even worse in the hospital. But when he came out of surgery and he had uh, his first meal, like dry toast and weak tea, it was like the best cup of tea he'd ever had. It was the best toast he'd ever had. And I'm looking at him like, I couldn't believe this guy. But that's honestly how it felt to him. And he's never looked back. Was that the end of his, the disease? No. He went in and out of tumors and having to have tumors removed and so on and so forth and so on and so forth for another eight years. He is now cancer free. He has his boat loaded on his truck yesterday. He's going fishing today. And he's never been happier. Ken taught me that all of us are more than our diagnoses, whatever the case may be. I've had the privilege in uh, here in Canada, in the US and other countries, in talking with people who um, have had various diseases and um, you know, multiple sclerosis. My uh, grandson had multiple sclerosis and lived way beyond what he was diagnosed to live and was one of the happiest, most loving children, teenagers, adults that I ever met, severely handicapped in a wheelchair, fed by a tube through his, his mouth and throat. In love with life. He loved life. I could see that he didn't see there was anything wrong with him because he was so full of love. The only time I saw him distressed was when my son uh, and his wife and our grandson were over and our son was driving down the driveway during uh, heavy snow and slid into the ditch and we were watching from the window. And um, his wife, my daughter-in-law, got very upset and anxious, you know, was Ron going to be okay? And he was fine, but my grandson got agitated because of feeling his mom's fear. Other than that, he lived in a world of love, confined in his wheelchair. When he was finally put into a group home at about the age of 17, because it was too difficult to care for him at home, he loved the group home and being, you know, uh, amongst other young teenagers and so on. And every now and then the group home would take these youngsters um, into the mall just so they could be around and, you know, uh, see others. And, and my grandson, his eyes would just light up because he loved looking at the girls in the mall, like just nature, natural. And, and he'd just be smiling, like looking at all these young girls walking back and forth in the mall. He loved life. 
And so seeing beyond our diagnosis as best as we can to know that we are more, that makes my heart sing. We are more. Not only are we enough, the way we are, going in and out of our understanding, we are more than enough. I'm gonna pause here. I was thinking that statement, what a beautiful statement to pause on. That was beautiful, what else? Does that make sense to you all in terms of what makes your heart sing? Like that you see we are more than enough, that we are more than our so-called problems, that we are more than our diagnosis. I, I'd like some feedback. I was just gonna say, just on the lunch break today, often on our retreats, we go for a walk around the park and we've bumped into this little boy, pretty much every retreat. And he's always got a ball stuck up in a tree and his mum's always despairing at him. And, we had a bit of a chat with his mum today and she said he has a diagnosis of autism and uh, he has a big scar in his head where he um, had surgery for epilepsy about six years ago and it, it has stopped the seizures but she said they can't kind of now see the extent of his autism and then as she was telling me this he found a, a dead starling on the floor and, and, he, and he picked it up and he was really sad that this this starling was dead and he just said I, I love this I love this bird and I'm going to call it Ruby. And he really wanted to take it home with him. But his mum said, we, we can't keep to, that on top of the fridge. I want to put it on top of the fridge. Oh. So we promised him, we, we put it in a, we had a, a little box with us where you'd had your lunch. And we said, we promised him we'd, we'd bury it later. But you could see that his mum kind of despairs at him a little bit. But he was just so full of love. And he always wants to connect and talk to us. And it's like beyond the diagnoses, he's just this little being of, of love and, and light really and he wanted to kiss it he said can what i kiss was that? It? he said i want to kiss it i want to kiss that dead <laughs> starling can i kiss it and i was of course oh. you can make sure your mom doesn't see of course you can kiss the starling so I opened up the box he gave it a kiss but he wanted to put it on top of the fridge because that's where his siblings dad's ashes were. yeah his siblings oh. dad's ashes were oh. but it was just such a it was you, you, you see how people do get tangled up in the all the and I get it, I get it. Living with somebody, you know, can be difficult from time to time. But it can very quickly become all that we see and we don't get to see the beauty. Yeah. I know, I know for myself, forgive me for, for one moment. I know it was one thing that my dad's on at the moment. Yeah. And uh, my dad and I didn't always see eye to eye. We're, we're quite uh, two stags. It's always rutting season in our house. I remember when I woke up and after I'd woken up and I got together with Jenny. And I remember, I remember my dad saying to me, I told him I was I'd fallen in love with Jenny and I had a girlfriend at the time. And he said, uh, I remember him saying, when are you going to stop doing this? When are you going to stop doing this, Dave? Do you not think about other people? And I was just like, piss off, leave me alone. This is my life. Stay out of my life. That's how we, that's how we kind of spoke to each other. That's how we kind of addressed each other. It's horrible. And Dad stormed off into the other room, sat down. And I remember, I remember my mind quietened down. And I remember just having this 
clarity just come through me and it was just so simple it was so simple i couldn't see it in my in my state i was in at that time such simplicity your dad loves your partners dave he loved rach who i was married to i spoke with her and he loved her and he loved manda he loves manda who i spoke with for jenny he wasn't trying to get in my way. He wasn't trying to piss me off. He was hurt and he was upset because he felt like he was losing somebody out of his life who he loved and it hurt him. It hurt him. He was hurting, God bless him. And I remember in that moment, I remember just, I walked through into the sitting room and I said, I realized, you know, I just want to see more love in this world. And that's what my dad's feeling. I remember I walked through to my dad and I said, look, dad, I know you love Rach, my ex-wife. You're allowed to love her and you're allowed to see her. You're allowed to spend time with her, go for meals, go for cups of coffee, go for walks. And you're allowed to love Manda. Please. Have her around for meals. Go for walks, take her out for cups of coffee. She's still your friend, dad allowed to love her i said but there's a new person coming into your life who you can fall in love with as well and i remember that was just it was one of those moments where i saw my ego my it's all about me and i saw the innocence in my dad and it was like it's quite easy with families isn't it to get into the stories and not not meet the individual but meet the story that we carry Families are the hardest. We have such ingrained stories about our families that we never listen to one another. <laughs> it's so true, Dave. It's so true. Yeah. And the people we love the dearest, we, we miss them. We miss, we miss the most. Yeah. Yeah. It was like that with that kid, wasn't it? And this little starling that he, he kissed yeah. goodnight yeah. as it, as it departed this earth. I just want to shut up now and, just go to Claire or Big Mac because they've got their hands up. Okay. Thank you, Dave, for sharing that. That's so no, beautiful. And thank you. Story. Thank you, oh, boy. Wow. Yes. Hi, Claire, hi. Uh, I spoke to you on the last retreat uh, where I, I've had a, an amazing day because I Paul, just, quite... Paul, just come a bit closer, mate. Come a bit closer to your mic, please. Um, is that the... Is that all right now? Yes, I think so. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I spoke oh, on, the last, on the last retreat and I was the guy who was really angry. I'd been telling everyone on the retreat to kind of, I wanted to tell everyone to, pardon me language, to piss off. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not interested in your love and kindness. I wasn't feeling it. Um, and the whole day just turned around and and then I spoke to you shortly after. And it was It was amazing. And then this retreat again has been fascinating with lots of insights and you said a couple of things um i've always been i've always been self-critical on how i speak and how i sound and the language i use i've worked on building sites all my life and i've worked the only other job was a, a bouncer on a on bars and i didn't have the need for stringing long words together within those within those rules of my life so that's impacted on how I've, I've always felt about me public speaking. It's been a big fear. And just today you said um, your first insight is your graduation. And to hear that from you, because I've never said this about anyone, I would quite happily sit and listen to you all day. <laughs> you put something across in such a gentle way that I was just really chilled out and hearing every word, which is a... a a really strange thing for me to like, comprehend about myself. And it almost felt like kind of getting a blessing from someone when you said your first insight is your graduation to speak about this. Yes. And oh, beautiful. I never thought that people would be interested in what I've got to say. And then on every retreat and on every, pretty much every weekly uh, community group that Dave and Jen put out, I speak and people listen and people give us feedback and it's still like 
a bit of an uncomfortable feeling where I'm thinking, are these people really listening to me? Like, do I have actually something interesting that someone might learn from? And just from hearing those words from you about your, your first insight is your graduation to speak about this in every which way you want is a real, um, yeah, it felt like a real blessing, so thank you. Um, and am I right in thinking that to get a deeper understanding of the three principles, I'm also allowed to go to a mall to watch girls walk past. <laughs> I'm not touching that one. <laughs> if so, if so, I'll have that as a blessing as well. You can look, but don't touch. <laughs> You'll do for me, Elsie. Thank you. Love oh, you. thank you. That's lovely. And I love how you speak. I love how you speak. Because Sid, too, you know, Sid did not have, um, a, you know, he had very limited education. And so his, his language, his vocabulary wasn't great. But I'll tell you, it improved over the years, just naturally, being around other people, being around like the psychologists and doctors and that kind of thing. He just, his language, his vocabulary gradually increased and you can actually see it in his books same as me like my my usage of words is a little bit dicey and I actually had a close friend a few years back because I, I say the words wrong I'm hesitant I'm not sure is that the correct pronunciation or not and and so I my friends have teased me and said we need to have like Elsie's dictionary because I I mess up the words so badly. And, and my friend said to me, Elsie, is English your second language? <laughs> <laughs> it's not, you know, it's, uh, it's not. But I grew up in a, in a household where my mom and dad both spoke Ukrainian and most of my cousins and so on and so forth also spoke Ukrainian. So I learned a little bit of Ukrainian as a child I still have some words that, but mainly they're swear words, so I don't use them. <laughs> but when we were traveling in Prague a couple of years ago, I was able to actually try out my Ukrainian on some of the waiters or the bus driver, that kind of thing, you know, people on the street asking directions. And it was so cool, you know? So I love that everybody has their own unique voice. And why people hear you is it's got nothing to do with the way you speak. It's the wisdom coming through you. And, and honestly, I even say in that book of mine, Mentored by Mind, that my hope is that people that read that and read the stories are encouraged to release your original voice. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And there was someone else that had their hand up, I think, uh, Dave, you said. No, I was just gonna say, I'm really impressed because I couldn't understand a word you were saying there, Big Mac. <laughs> has, anybody, has anybody else got any questions for Elsie or comments or insights that they've shared, they'd like to share? We got Kelly, our oh, Kelly. Oh, Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Where did you go? There you go. Okay. I have to, I have to do it wrong first. First of all, it has to, I have to do it wrong and then it's okay. I just wanted to sort of share the, you know, with um, when someone is speaking from the truth, whether or not they're caught up in what's true for them in that exact moment, which might not be the inner truth. Whenever someone speaks from that wave place or that deep place, it's, there's an authenticity in it. Because in that, if you speak from that moment of the waves at that, in that particular moment, cause I've had to speak like that this, over this retreat, had a few things going on. And then I can feel myself coming down out of the tip of the wave and back into a more settled still place. And I think when you speak from so like with Mackie, you know, he doesn't, he, he's always surprised at how much kind of, um, 
how much we all appreciate when he shares and even when he's in the the waves or even when he's in the the deeper place where the wisdom comes from it's always very quite it's always very authentic and we can see that and that's I think that's why that's sort of that's why everybody enjoys it so much when when he speaks yes it's just there's just a you feel that connection and I, I mean I spoke about this the other night on the community group just this sort of connection between being able to speak with people around the three principles but being able to speak from that de deep place, but also having the space to talk, talk from that that top space that's full of turmoil and getting caught up, and you know, investing in the stories of our families and stuff. You know, the, the fact that we speak about that aspect of it too, and then that deeper aspect, and then that deeper still aspect. But they're authentic experiences. They seem to me like they're very authentic human experiences and. You know, yes, we look at the things that, you know, we can focus on the things that make us feel happy and feel joy. But sometimes when we speak of those things that are on the surface, we then start to really appreciate that place that we sort of fall into. And I liked being able to speak across the rainbow in this, in this group, in this community, in the three principles community, just to, to be able to speak the whole depth from the surface down to the really deep place as well. And you kind of can feel when you're there down here or when you're kind of up here. And it's just, just really nice to be able to be in a community where there's a space for that. Yes. And just appreciate that so much with everybody, Jenny and Dave, all the people that, and you know, just what you've said is really rung true to me. And I just, I just sort of hit a spot that just felt like a clear bell and that's, yes. And I get, and that's just, I'm mean, just really grateful to everyone for that. Uh, it's, it's all about the feeling. I mean, that's what I kept hearing, ping, 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 throughout what you were sharing, Kelly. Mm. It, it's just the feeling, the feeling, the feeling, the feeling. Yeah. You know, that's, that's our guidance system. I just also, just, well, like when you said, you know, that first insight is like, as, as uh, Mac, Mac has just repeated back to you, yeah, that's just that just sort of hit a very sweet spot. Ah, oh, beautiful. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, okay, who else was there? Who else, what? please? I was just saying that hit the spot for me as well, Elsie. It was like when you said that. It, oh yeah. I think that's a really important. It's a really important point. Yes. You know, uh, Linda Pettit just said on the call before you. When she asked, when somebody, oh, I think it was um, lady who does the prison work, Kathy Casey. Kathy Casey said, "Sid, what's <coughs> what's life all about?" And Sid took a while, and then he responded, "It's to it's to learn to love, learn to find love, and share love." Yeah, the words to that effect. And it's like, I feel like so many people. I know people with such deep understanding of the principles but they won't share it with the next person because one man, for example, he smokes. A dear, dear friend of mine, Doran, if you're watching this, <laughs> dear friend of mine, he won't share the principles because he smokes because he feels like he hasn't attained perfection yet. And it's like, mate, I said to him, if I, if my, in my darkest days, if I knew that you held the key to the secret to my psychological health, my well-being, my happiness, my joy, my fulfillment, but you wouldn't share it with me because you smoke, I'd have punched you in the face. And it's like, it can be really easy for us to, to really take for granted what we, what we, we, we think, oh, I've only seen a little bit. What's, what's a lot in infinity? What's yeah. a lot in infinity? You know, you can't measure your depth of knowledge. It's immeasurable. But the, the gifts that we've come across that changed our lives also have the opportunity, the smallest little nuggets of wisdom, as, you, as you've written your book about. They have the gifts. I remember one time we worked with a man who, 20 years in the psychiatric system, came to a two-hour session with us, agoraphobic, couldn't dare leave his house. Next day, he said sent me a text, I'm out of my house, I've been out for five hours, town has totally changed, I can't believe it, I'm free. Wow. 
we interviewed him and we said, what was it? You, what was it that you changed? What was it you heard? Do you know what it was? And he said, yeah, I know exactly what it was. What was it, please? And he said, I realized the past only existed in my mind. To me, ugh, it's nothing. You know, I, I, I take that for granted. Yeah. For that man, it was his awakening and his freedom to not only leave his house, he got a job, he got a promotion, he lost six stone in weight, he stopped drinking, he came off state benefit. Just that one insight, that one thing that I took for granted so much, that thing that perhaps I'd become really complacent about. It's like we can all help the next person. We can all help each other with love. And I love what you said, Else. That love ripples out. Such an important part. There's so many people fighting things in this world. We fight everything to human beings. We fight. Let's fight mental health. Let's fight. Let's fight cancer. Let's fight, fight, fight. Let's fight xenophobia. Let's fight. No, let's stop fighting. Let's learn to love. Let's take that language and throw it out it's old language let's get rid of that now and let's learn to love and come from love and that's the thing that will do the healing of this world it will do the healing of our soul it will do the healings of our physiology and it will do the healing of the world let's learn that and i love that point because i really didn't want that point to get missed that point you made there it's such a special point and that's what for us me and jen that's what it's all about so thanks else and, and you know dave when you were talking about family earlier and your dad, uh, it brought to mind a memory. Uh, I'm the youngest of, of our siblings in our family. And uh, my eldest sister now has passed on. But the story I want to share was to do with my eldest sister, who I love dearly. She was like a second mother to me. And then my next sister, who just celebrated her 80th birthday a couple of weeks ago. And it was her first time on Zoom. We had a, a family celebration and she didn't know what was happening because it was a surprise. And it's like, what, what do I do? Her son had brought her and she, you know, it was so surprised to see all the cousins and her sons and daughters and grandchildren and so on. It was just beautiful. But when we moved back, Ken and I from California back to Salt Spring Island, partly um, because we felt drawn to come back to the island to to be with Sid, and partly because Ken's mom had um, dementia, the, um, the, the start of dementia, and was becoming increasingly difficult to care for, and we just felt we needed to be here for family and, and to be with Sid again. And, um, and I tried to teach my sisters, and being the youngest of the, the three of us, um, they weren't having any of it. It's like, you know, you, you're doing this woo-woo stuff. Don't talk to us about this woo-woo stuff. Um, but it took me a while. Like, you would have thought I would have learned because I did that with Ken in our early years when I was first starting to travel with Sid. And I was thinking I was so hot because I was traveling with Sid and Ken was home sort of caring for the children and working. And it wasn't until Sid quite firmly told me I should listen to, uh, to Ken, that Ken had wisdom too, and like kind of shut up, Elsie, and listen to Ken as well. And that took me aback. And I did. I started to listen more, and that really helped us. And I stopped trying to teach Ken, waving my finger in front of his nose, saying, it's just thought, hon. It's just thought. And so I was started to do that with my sisters because I just, you know, part of it was I really wanted them. They were both very unhappy in their marriages. And I really wanted to help them, you know, find some solace and some peace and some love. And, but they didn't ask me, you know, they didn't ask me. I, I just went at them. And so living on Salt Spring and they lived on the bigger island, Vancouver Island, I would go over every now and then every couple of weeks and have lunch with them and what not, and they both worked at what you call a charity shop. And um, so we would sometimes go to the charity shop and look around and then go for lunch and whatnot. And about three months after we were back here on the island, um, once again, I'm going over to have lunch with my sisters. And 
because they were so unhappy, the feeling could get kind of toxic over lunch because they would go on and on about how bad their life was and how bad their husbands were and all this kind of thing. And I, I just couldn't stand the negativity. And I didn't know how to handle it. Like I couldn't be at peace in the midst of that negativity. And I didn't know what to do. And they would say, you know, why don't you spend the night? And it's like, God, no, no way would I want to spend the night. It's like I can barely take three hours. I'm sorry, I'm being honest. I know this doesn't sound very loving, but that's where I was when we first met, moved back like 16 years ago. That's where I was. I couldn't take it. And, and so in a way, like, I was grateful that I knew enough, at least, not to try to prove I can take this negativity. You know what I mean? Like, I respected my own soul and spirit enough to, I'm, I'm staying connected, I'm doing the best I can, that's the best I can, and then off I'd come on the ferry and I'd come back home. Okay, going on three months, I am lessening my talk with them, you know, finally realizing they don't really want to hear. They, they turn me off. I can tell the feeling isn't good when I try to teach. And so I'm just going to be with them and just enjoy my time with them and do my best. Like if I can change the subject when they start getting too negative about their husbands, then I would see what came to me in the moment. It was kind of like that. Just see what comes in the moment. And so our relationships did start to ease up and get a little nicer together, but I still wouldn't spend the night. And then finally, say this third month, um, we ended up going to the charity shop before lunch. And I went in to try on a blouse in the dressing room. And I overheard my eldest sister talking to someone, one of the clerks there and saying, oh yes, I'm so proud of my sister. She just has done amazing. You know, she started her own business and she travels around and I just, I'm perking up like a peacock. And I'm thinking, oh my God, like she's talking about me and what I'm doing that I, I travel to Europe and I'm doing teaching and all this. And then she mentioned my, my other sister. Because she said, oh, yes, and she goes to all these garage sales and buys things, and then she brings them home. She has her own business, you know, and then she sells these things from her home, her own garage sale. So she was talking about my other sister, not about me. And that did it. That deflated the peacock. And I realized that once again, it's not about whether they see me as who I am now, just to love them with no conditions, that agape, just love them, period. And that really changed the dynamics because I wasn't then looking for approval. I wasn't looking for them to see me I just was with them. And nowadays, like even before my eldest sister passed, um, I went in to see her the day before she passed. And our relationship by this time was very loving and kind. And her youngest son became a priest, a Catholic priest. And he and I really connected. We talked about God in different ways. Like he saw God completely different than I did. But there was a feeling between us that overrode our difference in words, in description. Where we communicated was we honored there was something bigger than us, period, whatever we called it. I called it this formless spiritual energy in, inside everybody. My nephew, the priest, called it God. And he saw it as a, you know, as a thing. I didn't care. It was just the feeling between us that connected. So when I went in to see my sister for the last time, 
my nephew was there and uh, and and she was just in the most beautiful loving space knowing she was going home like she wouldn't have even said it like that but she just was at peace and and i said to her like can i get you anything she said oh no no i'm not hungry and i said would you like a cabbage roll because she used to be famous for making these cabbage rolls and she she lit up and she said oh you could get a cabbage roll and i said oh yeah i can go to the deli down the street i'll bring you back a cabbage roll so she said okay and her son stayed with her and off i went trotting to get this cabbage roll do you know what cabbage smells like when it's cooked you know it can be quite flavorful um, to some people it might be rather odorous so I come into this hospital smelling it's like disinfectants and Lysol and there I am carrying my bag of cabbage rolls into her hospital room the doctors and nurses are looking what have you got there and I said it's a cabbage roll for my sister pure love pure love and she ate like one little tiny spoonful it wasn't the cabbage roll it was the love and that was how we spent our time i never ever tried to teach them again after that time in the charity shop when i got so puffed up and then deflated and i realized it's not about wanting anybody's approval when we really see we're not only enough but we're more than enough and we see that we have this that we're a graduate and a student so that sometimes when we get tangled up in our personal thinking that's the student. That's our opportunity to learn even more. That's not the time to judge ourselves like, why am I still getting gripped by my thinking? Why am I still smoking? Who cares? That's the time when we're a student. And we're a graduate because we already have what we're looking for inside so the graduate and the student the same coin and that's where i'm going to leave it lovely elsie thank you so so much elsie have you got time for a quick question from penny she's just she put oh, her hand yes. up about five minutes ago yes, if it's yes. a question or a statement i don't know yet it, okay it's it's kind of a statement. You just reminded me, obviously, of um, I've been at war with my mum most of my life. And my mum is set in the story of my parents' divorce, and which was 40 years ago. She's 86. She still works. She's amazing. She doesn't believe she's amazing. But we've kind of been in this battle. And when I I discovered the principles four years ago, and my reaction was, oh, I can help my mum. <laughs> you know, the truth is I can't help my mum. But we don't battle like that anymore because I just realised that I do love her. And it is, she, she, she is amazing. I'm sad that she doesn't see that, but I see that. And I love her for it. And I'm proud of her. And, and and now things are more peaceful. So you just, your story with your sisters just reminded me um, that that was something that the, the, the principles have taught me. That's the wisdom that I've got from the principles. And that's how you're helping her, Penny, that you love her. That's the most help. That's the teacher. Honestly, that's the teacher. That's what you've discovered. Bless your heart. Good on you, girl. Thank you. Thank you. That is beautiful. We often say if a relationship of, say, two people is is 100%, if 50% of that relationship changes, if 50% of that relationship starts to become more aware, the whole relationship has to change. Yes. It has to. It has to change. It can't stay the same. It has to change. 
Well, thank you both again, thank honestly, you. for inviting me. I just feel you so grateful you. that thank you've invited me and to talk with you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I know we've gone over actually by 15 minutes. So thank you for spending the extra time with us. Uh, yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. I don't know if you want to join us else, if you want to leave or if anybody else wants to leave. I, I you, am going to leave. You now. leave it. You leave then, Elsie. Thank you, love. OK, bye, everybody. Yeah, bless you. Thank, Thank you, sweetheart. You. Thank you. We, we like to do a thing at the end of our community groups. And it's as Elsie was speaking just then. We like to just have five minutes just to put love out into the world as Elsie was speaking about the, the ripple effect of love. So anybody who would like to join us, please stay just for five minutes, just to generate that feeling and just think, of, think about all the beautiful things that we do have in our life to be grateful for. Just a time for quiet, just to reflect. So those that wish to stay, please do. Absolutely no problem if you don't. We've got everybody's name who's on the screen. You'll receive an email. Thank you. You lot didn't get to experience that. Well away. Thank you, everyone. This is the last day of the retreat. And I just want to say an absolutely enormous thank you to everybody who's donated. We do do this via donation. So a massive thank you to everybody who's donated. Real generosity. Thank you so much. I think I meant to say it when Elsie was on, but also the reason we are able to do these events via donation is because we have the love and support of our families, yeah. our both sets of parents and yeah. really supported us in the work that we do. And we wouldn't be able to do it without no, them. And we, we know that not everyone's in the in this position where they can, um, but that, that is the reason why we can. So yeah. and they're both on. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, families. And thank you, all our friends. And thank you, everyone, just for being. Like we've said, it would be such a boring retreat if it was Dave and I just sat here and no one turned up. So thank you for turning up and being here with us. I'm always sad on the last day. It's like I'm filled full of love and I just, I just want to give everybody a massive hug. What we were thinking was we do a community group each Thursday night, UK time, 7 o'clock. Anybody's welcome. It's a community group. This world is... In a, we are a global community of beings. It's not just for Cumbria or the Northwest or anything like that. And we have people from all over the world join us. So this is a community for people. And we thought that we'd make this Thursday, 7 p.m. UK time, a follow up um, to just discuss anything that may have come up following the retreat or any insights people want to share, any stories or anything like that. We'd love to hear it. So keep an eye out on the Freedom Thinking Facebook page about that. Anybody who isn't on Freedom Thinking Facebook page, please join. Yeah, and if you plant on Facebook, then um, we send out a newsletter possibly once a month, maybe every two months. Uh, yeah. So if you sign up to our newsletter, you won't get hounded, but um, you won't get you'll, hounded. you'll find out about events and, and community groups and videos and things that way if you're not on Facebook. Yeah. So I'll just... Does anybody want to say anything before we go? Just a huge thank you. Massive thank, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Really, a huge thank you to everybody. Yeah, thanks, Ben. I'm, I'm so touched to know some, you know, to know you guys in, in this way. Those two. All of you. Thank you. Can I ask a question? No, you can't, Mark. No. Hold <laughs> her off. Are we live? No. Or is this a recording? <laughs> just a few minutes <laughs> thank you to everybody who shared thank you to everybody yeah, I'd love to thank you to David Jen he's an absolute diamond 
as your system makes it so easy and normal to talk and relax and a great place for learning. Yeah, I'd love it. I really do, so thank you. No, I didn't understand a word of that. Don't worry, don't worry though, Dave. I still love you. I know you think you're feeling sad because it's the end of the retreat. You can call at any time. You need a shoulder to cry on. You know, our romance is still there. I hope somebody can understand him. <laughs> big big <laughs> thank you, you from me. Oh, Lorraine, thank you so um, much, love. We haven't met before, and um, I've never heard Elsie speak before either. Um, so what a treat. Amanda um, sent me the link. Yeah, um, she did. She did say, actually, yeah. Yeah, so thank you so much. And um, I'll email you both later anyway so we can connect. And, Please. Um, I, I'd love to come on a live retreat if you've got any planned. As soon as we can, we will be. They're yeah. usually held in Grasmere in the middle of the Lake District. Yeah, Sharon's, that, Sharon's pumping it. They're that great. would be we amazing. Um, I'm in Leicestershire, so I'm not that far away. <laughs> That's not bad. That's yeah, not bad. It's three hours. Yeah, yeah no, I'd love, love to. Mm -hmm. We love it. We so we usually do the retreats in somewhere called Glenthorne, which is actually a Quaker, a Quaker place. But they have a lovely little conference room, accommodation, foods part. It's all full board, and then there's the beautiful little cafes in there and there's the pubs and the walks from Grasmere are just brilliant. You're right in the middle of the lakes. Amazing. So we'll, as soon as we can, we'll be getting one of them booked. So we'll let people know. Yes. John said, just quick, John said the other day, when we go to England, what are we going to see? And I said, what are you going to show me? I said, greens. And he said, greens. I said, yeah, all the, all the different greens. And he said, Lots of greens. I was like trees and lakes. And he's like, London Bridge. Uh, you know, he started rattling off all these like tourist places. I'm like, no, 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 the greens, <laughs> <laughs> and the lakes. I don't know any of those other places. <laughs> queen? Did I say the queen? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It must have been asked by about three Americans in my lifetime. Do I know the queen? No. <laughs> I know England. I know Great Britain small, but but no, no. <laughs> I love it. No, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Kel. Love you, lass. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for your, your contribution. See you soon. See you soon. See you soon, Pete. Love you, big man. Right. Bye, Kelly. See you next time. See you all in the future. Bye. Bye. In the now. What do you want for your teeth? Oh, anything.